A history professor at a large university was giving a final exam to his freshman class. After the two-hour time limit had ended, he announced that the test was now over and instructed the students to please come forward and place their test booklets on his desk. One by one, the 250 students in the class passed by his desk, some mumbling words of discouragement as they placed their books, others simply just shaking their heads in disappointment. As the class emptied and the professor started to look at the three piles of examination booklets now placed on his desk, he noticed that in the back of the classroom there was still one student who was busily at work. He coughed loudly to get the student's attention, <clears throat> reminding him that the time of the exam was now over and he was to come forward and to place his exam booklet on his desk. The student didn't budge, kept on working, never even looked up. You can imagine the professor already starting to become upset at this. And so he called out loudly to the student, young man, put down your pencil. Bring your book here, the time of the exam is over. The student, undaunted, continued writing in his book. The professor now began to fume. He began to be very angry and decided that he would teach this young man a lesson. So he sat down calmly behind his desk and waited for him to finish, thinking to himself that as this young man approached with his booklet, he would simply and ceremoniously rip it to shreds in front of him and give him an F for the entire semester. Five minutes passed. 10 minutes pass, 20 minutes pass, and finally the student closes his book and begins to come forward to the professor's desk and announces, I'm done. The professor looks angrily at the student. You expect me to accept your test now? The student looks, begins to frown, sees the pile of examinations on the desk, begins to think to himself, look at the professor, peers into his eyes, do you know who I am? I don't know and I don't care. The student takes his booklet, picks up the pile, sticks it in the middle and walks out. <laughs> Sometimes in life, it's good to be anonymous. We seem to feel that when we are anonymous, when our identity is unknown, that we can be granted certain liberties to behave in ways that are not true to our nature because no one is there to call us to task. In the course of the past few days, young adults from this community and other surrounding communities and quite frankly from parishes throughout the archdiocese in various uh, states around the country have gathered here to learn a little bit more about themselves, to be able to be acquainted with one another, to look at the, at the theme of integrating life, a life of Christ, into our daily lives, and to try to understand better that challenge that I think all of us, no matter what our age, no matter where we find ourselves on our spiritual journey, struggle with. How is it that we integrate what we hear in the gospel into our every action and into our every thought, allowing that light of Christ that we receive at the time of resurrection to give us strength and the power to bring light even into the darkest areas? And so when we start to look at this particular theme and we start uh, using my little uh, humorous story to see the difference of being anonymous. And the difference of being anonymous is to be known and to understand that God knows who we are as individuals. 
as we hear in one of the uh, beautiful prayers of the liturgy of Saint Basil from the time of our mother's womb. In the book of Psalms, in Psalm 139, we hear very beautifully and very poetically how well the Lord knows each and every one of us. And I quote, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. As a father, it always interests me when you watch young children play hide and go seek. Right? They cover their own eyes, thinking that once they cover their own eyes, that you can't see them, that somehow they can do anything because they can't see you. And in the same way, we begin to recognize how well God knows us. That sometimes when we feel that his presence is not there, that sometimes when we feel perhaps we have lost our way or he has simply forgotten about us, that we are called to remember that young child placing his or her hand in front of their own eyes. That we are placing our eyes in front and thinking somehow that if we close ourselves off, that God will not see us, that he will not care for us and somehow not love us. And again from the same Psalms. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. Imagine now how well our Lord knows us. I will praise you for I am fearful and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, my eyes saw my substance yet being unformed and in your book they were all written. The days fashioned me and yet there were none of them. The psalmist, again, in 139, begins to speak now of the depth of God's plan for us. That it begins not after we are born, not after we choose a career path, not after um, our schooling is somehow finished where we, be, where we think that we become so knowledgeable in things in this world, but rather he knows us from the time that we are formed within our mother's womb. And he knows us, he loves us, and he cares for us. What a wonderful and tremendous image that is. To know that even if we fall, even if we find ourselves astray, that our Lord will be there constantly watching over us, constantly calling us back to him, constantly giving us strength and showing us and trying to shine for us light in all types of darkness. I wish to conclude just with the final uh, two verses of the same psalm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me to the way everlasting. As we travel home from this church this morning or from the conference uh, after the closing luncheon. Open up your Bibles and reread this Psalm 139. Look in the depths of the words and understand what it is that we are asking God to do. We are asking Him to show us, even in what we may consider the bleakest of times, His great mercy and His great love. And when we understand how much we are loved, how much our Lord cares for us, what he has offered us freely, then we will be begin to look at the world 
in a different light. Then we will understand what it means to have life in this life. Just a few announcements before you come forward to receive a holy andidron from Father Joel. Uh, you heard me mention a few moments ago about the young adult conference that uh, our community hosted, and I am uh, so thankful to those who were in charge as well as those who have come and attended and were able to uh, listen to the wonderful speakers yesterday. The conference comes to a close this afternoon uh, after a luncheon. Everyone is invited to please join us. We have a, uh, a very special uh, guest with us, a dear friend, uh, the National Philoptohos Chairperson, Aphroditis Kedas. And so I welcome her and her husband, Peter, and uh, pray that many of us will be able to come downstairs. She will offer a, a few words uh, during the luncheon as well, kind of closing out and tying up uh, the entire program. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful week.